Okay, this is a lecture for my eighth hour U.S. history class on uh, April 6th. Okay, that's my eighth hour class for April, Wednesday, April the 6th. Um, and I remind you that if you have makeup exams, since we had a virtual day today, today would usually be the deadline. And I think I told you that in class, but I've extended that until tomorrow. So anyway, get any makeup test that you have uh, completed uh, by tomorrow. Uh, well, I want to go on today. And when we left off the other day, we were talking about the fact that in uh, 1917, the United States went to war uh, because of uh, primarily because of uh, the sinking of American ships by German submarines, unrestricted submarine warfare. And, of course, the country was not united uh, in going to war. Wilson asked for war, and then he went back to the White House and wept, uh, and the Congress debated it all day into the night, and finally they declared war. But 60 people, around 60 representatives and senators, voted against the war, there were isolationists that were against the war. They said, we have no business going to war in Europe. And there were pacifists who were against the war. They said, we ab uh, abhor all violence. Uh, there were uh, uh, socialists and communists who were opposed to the war. Uh, you know, Irish Americans. And many, 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 the vast majority of Irish Americans loyally supported the United States during the war, went to fight the war, same way with German Americans, uh, but Irish Americans said, look, England took over our country 300 years ago, Ireland, uh, and we've been fighting to get them out ever since. We hope the British lose. We're not going to go fight on the side of the British. Uh, some Germans, not many, but some Germans left this country to go and fight for the, quote, fatherland, to fight for, uh, fight for Germany. And these were Germans, by the way, whose families had been here for generations. They had... Uh, they had been here for generations. They were uh, people who, uh, and, and they were thoroughly American, okay? Probably couldn't even speak German, but they went uh, back to their uh, ancestral uh, home, okay? So the country, the, the point is, is that the country was divided on this. Uh, and Wilson wants, get this down, Wilson wants to unite the country. He wants to unite the country around the world, and so... Woodrow Wilson and the U.S. government, they're going to uh, adopt certain laws and measures to try and foster or bring about unity in the country. And they're going to succeed, but only to a degree. Uh, for example, as soon as the war was declared, all right, as soon as the war was declared, a commission or a committee or a board was formed. It was called, uh, and, and by the way, I, I don't know if you can see this, but if you can't uh, see what I'm writing on the board, just do the best you can. And tomorrow when you come back at the beginning of class, I will uh, answer any questions that you have over anything that you missed. It's called the War Industries Board, okay? The War Industries Board. And I think you got that down yesterday. And the man who was put in charge of the War Industries Board was a man named Bernard Bernard Baruch, and let me tell you, Bernard Baruch had a tremendous, had a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount of power. In fact, get this down, the War Industries Board ran, ran the, the national economy. You know, I think about the government asking, you know, asking uh, Americans to wear a mask and uh, the great hue and cry went up, you know, you're violating my freedom. I'm an American. I can do what I want, which that's not true. But that's what they said uh, over the issue of the government asking people to wear to wear masks. OK. Um, and in federal government buildings and jobs and the, they require the, they did have requirements in school. We had a requirement. But the, so far as the general public was concerned, asking and people just thought, you know, you're trying to take away all my freedom. Well, imagine this. The government, uh, the, this, this board established by the government headed by B Bernard Baruch, they set prices. You know, they, 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 told, they told people who own the Ufala Market and Nichols Grocery, uh, the, the town grocery stores, they told them, you're not going to raise your prices for the duration of the war. This is what you're going to sell a loaf of bread for. This is what you're going to sell a gallon of milk for. They didn't ask them, by the way, you know, would you like to do that? Or would you please do that? They said, this is what you're going to do. And if you don't do it, you're going to be in violation of the law and you're going to be arrested. They told landlords, they told landlords, 
that they said, you're not going to raise the rent as long as nobody knows how long the war is going to go on. It could go on another year, another five years. But as long as the war goes on, you're not going to raise your rent. And they told working men in this and women in this country, you're not going to get a pay raise as long as the war is going on. But since you're not going to get a pay raise, we're not going to let we're not going to let uh, uh, your your landlord or the guy who owns the corner grocery store raise their price, raise your rent or raise their prices. But you're not going to get a pay raise. And by the way, if you go on strike, we're going to arrest you. If you don't like that and you go out in the streets on strike, we're going to uh, we're going to arrest you. Um, they told factories, this is what you're going to produce. They said the type, you know, the typewriter in those days was as big as the computer is today. They said the typewriter factories, you're not going to make typewriters. You're going to make ammunition. We're not asking you to do that. We're telling you, we're telling you to do that. And if you don't do it, we'll take over your business and we will produce ammunition until the war's over. Then you can come back and you can make typewriters. They told farmers, you're not going to decide what crops you're going to plant. We will decide what crops you're going to plant. They took over the railroads. This is the government. They took over the railroads. I can imagine the reaction today. I guess we would have to stretch a big net in front of the gym because people would be jumping. But they took over and they ran the railroads. You know, the populist up in heaven must have shouted hallelujah when they did that. You know, we just went to daylight savings time. What is the purpose of daylight savings time? To create a longer day. The longer the day is, the less electricity you use. What produces electricity? Oil. We've got to conserve oil to send it. Uh, we need that to fight the war. So we're going to extend the day. By the way, there's a debate going on in the Congress right now, uh, or it's been proposed. I don't know how much of a debate there is going on, but it's been proposed that they do away with daylight savings time. I think there's one state, I know there's one state, uh, at least that doesn't do that. They never change their clocks. It's the same year round. I think it's Indiana, but I may be wrong about that. But anyway, you want to know where daylight savings time started? It was to save electricity. If you save electricity, you save oil. If you save oil, you have more oil uh, to fuel our ships and tanks and all the things we need to fight this war. They even, just think about this, the government, they even regulated the number of stops that an elevator could make. If you worked in a skyscraper on the fifth floor, the elevator might, st or on the 10th floor, excuse me, the elevator might stop on the fifth floor and you had to walk up five flights of stairs or it might stop uh, on the uh, 15th floor and you had to walk down five flights of stairs because every time that uh, elevator stopped and started, it used electricity and they wanted to conserve that. In other words, they left no stone unturned. The government has its hands all over the economy. Write this man down, Herbert Hoover. <clears throat> By the way, food is going to be rationed. Food is going to be rationed. And there's an effort to conserve food, okay? Herbert Hoover. Remember him, he's later going to be president of the United States. He's the president of the United States when the Great Depression starts. You notice I didn't say, like a lot of people, Herbert Hoover caused the Depression. Presidents don't cause depressions, but that's another topic for another day. When we get to Hoover, I'll explain that to you. But Herbert Hoover was the president when the Depression, he was sitting in the White House when forces beyond his control, forces beyond his control caused the Great Depression. Now, his reaction to the Depression was something else, but that's a different topic. But so far as Herbert Hoover uh, causing the Depression, uh, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, but I don't want you to write this down. He was, this is all before he was president. Uh, he's the chief food administrator, and he controls the food supply. He's the chief food administrator, and he controls the food supply of the United States. He controls the food supply of the United States government. He said, we've got to save food. Uh, food is rationed, like I say. You couldn't go down and buy whatever you wanted. What, in America? Yeah, in America or the United States. Get this down. To save food, he institutes Wheatless Mondays. On that day, Americans were encouraged not to eat bread. Take one day a week out and don't eat any bread. That's more food for our troops. Also, these are self-explanatory, Meatless Tuesdays. Do without meat every Tuesday. The less meat you cons consume, the more there is for our troops. The more there is for our troops. Um, and I want to say this about all of these measures. You know what? What? Uh, uh, you know when they when they said uh, what what this was all about. Get this down. Was to involve as many Americans as possible in the war. You know, today, 
less than 1%, 0.5%, that's less than 1% of Americans actually put on the uniform and go defend this country. And the way we fight wars today, we send our young men and women to places like Afghanistan and they take care of the bad guys for us and it doesn't change our lives one bit. We're all going to the prom. We're all going to the mall. We're going to be at the movies, you know. And uh, here we fought a war in Afghanistan. To show you how concerned we are, here we fought a war in Afghanistan for 20 years. And uh, I've said this before in my classes. Uh, if we have called a school assembly and I put a blank map of the world up there on the big screen and I said, you know, I don't know, 14 free tardies or something, who could come point to Afghanistan? How many people do you think could? Well, obviously, maybe some could, but uh, I, I'm sure there would be many people shocked in there to learn that we had been at war in Afghanistan and 6,000 young Americans had died in 20 years. That's the way we fight wars today. Woodrow Wilson said, we're going to get everybody involved in this war. A successful war, and he was right about this, a successful war must have the support of the nation. Uh, it must be a national effort. Everyone must support the war. So we're going to uh, uh, not, the, the soldiers aren't the only ones that are going to contribute to the war effort. They're going to be the main contributors, of course. But people back home, people back home, uh, we're going to ration things. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to, uh, you're not, you're not going to get a pay raise until the war is over. And uh, so on and so on, all these things I've talked about. And we're going to ask you to sacrifice because we want you to be part of this war effort as well. And that's what this, that's what all this was about. It wasn't necessarily saving bread. It saved bread and it was more food for the troops, but there was a bigger cause or reason uh, for uh, these things uh, that the government institute during World War I. And also get this down. The uh, war was financed, World War I was financed by bonds, okay? Savings bonds. I don't know uh, how much you know about how savings bonds work. Uh, uh, a lot of people used to buy savings bonds. Uh, when I was a boy, saving bond, savings bonds were a pretty good investment. But here's the way a saving bonds, saving bond works. And this is another effort by the government to get people involved in the war. You know, you can go down today to the Bank of Ufala or the Farmer and Merchants Bank, I think it's called now, or the, uh, the uh, uh, Arvest Bank, and you can say, I want to buy a savings bond. Let's just say I want to buy a $50 savings bond. So you would give the person $50, and they would give you a bond, okay? Now, the bank doesn't keep that money. The, they would, it would be sent to the United States government. What you do when you buy a savings bond is you are loaning your government money. And so, uh, you know, if, if say you're, you buy a bond, they all have a maturity date. In other words, I buy the bond in 2022, that bond will not be mature until 2027. It's a five-year bond. But in 2027, you take your bond down, it's a $50 bond, you say, I'm ready to cash my bond in, and the bank, the, the, the U.S. government, through that bank, will pay you $50 plus interest. You've loaned the government money. Just like if you take out a loan, you pay interest. You're loaning your government money and the government will pay you interest. And maybe, maybe that $50 bond, I don't know what the bond rates are now. I don't think they're very good, but maybe it would be $65. Uh, you've loaned your government money and now the government's going to pay you back uh, with interest for the money you loaned it. Well, that's the way World War I uh, and to a large degree, World War II uh, was financed, okay, through savings bonds. And everywhere you went, there were people selling savings bonds. When you went to the post office, there would be a table set up uh, there in the lobby. People were selling bonds. Um, when you went to the movies, when you came out of the movie, uh, there was a table set up in the lobby of the theater, and people were selling bonds. Uh, movie stars, uh, tremendous athletes, great athletes, college and professional baseball players, football players. They went all over the country uh, selling bonds. You know, if uh, we said we're going to have a bond rally at uh, you fall a high school stadium here, uh, Ironhead Stadium, uh, and Tom Brady is going to be the speaker, why thousands of people from all over the state, and maybe from two or three states surrounding us, would drive down here to see the great Tom Brady 
that Tom Brady might, if this was this were World War One, and Tom Brady would, you know, in World War One, it was guys like Red Grange, who was called Saturday's hero, uh, uh, played for the University of Illinois, great uh, college football player. You know, those are the people who are going out on these bond drives, uh, and thousands of people come out to hear them, and they would start by saying, "I'm buying five. I, I just purchased five thousand dollars worth of bonds. I encourage you to buy bonds." Well, not everybody can afford five thousand dollars, but you might you might buy a hundred dollars worth of bonds. Uh, again, it was getting the American people involved in this war, and it was a way to finance the war uh, without uh, raising uh, taxes, okay? So all that's taking place as soon as the war starts. I also want you to write this down. Uh, during World War I, once the war starts in the United States, civil liberties suffered. Civil liberties Civil liberties suffered, okay? Civil liberties suffered. You know, <clears throat> your, your civil liberties are your constitutional liberties. An example of civil liberties is the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, the First Amendment of the Constitution protects your right to speech. It protects, your, well, let's do religion, speech, press, petition, assembly. If you think the government's doing something wrong, you have the right to petition your government. You have the right to assemble and protest what the government does. If you're arrested, this isn't the First Amendment, but it's, it's the Sixth Amendment, but if, if you're arrested, you have the right to a jury trial. And if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be provided for you. Uh that doesn't come from the police academy. That comes from the Constitution. Those were, that comes from the Constitution of the United States. The first 10 amendments is what we call them. The Bill of Rights. There are contained most of your civil liberties, but not all of them, okay? There are contained most of your civil liberties. And what I'm saying to you is, get this down, that a lot of people in America during World War I, a lot of people in America during World War I uh, were denied by the government their civil liberties. Okay, they were denied that by their by the government. You know, before the war started and here in the United States, we had protests saying don't go to war. We had a debate in the Congress. Sixty people voted against the war. But the attitude of the government, get this down, the attitude of the government once the war once we are in the war, it's okay to protest and debate the war before we go they said, but once the war is declared and once we are in it, and once we have boys uh, in France fighting, in the fighting and dying in the trenches, then all Americans must support the war. That's the general attitude of the government. And if you didn't, if you didn't, you could be in trouble. Uh, in fact, get this down. This is an age of intolerance. Intolerance means we must all be the same. If you're not the same, if you don't think the same and act the same as everybody else concerning the war, uh, you might, might be an American. You might not be a true blue, red-blooded, patriotic American. In fact, you might be working to defeat the United States in this war. You might be a German spy, and we're not going to allow that. Everyone must support the war. If you don't, you're in trouble. Get this down. Traditional minority groups, who in many instances were already denied their constitutional rights before the war started, traditional minority groups, such as African Americans, Roman Catholics, communist, socialist, pacifist, members of labor unions. You know, labor unions were told you can't strike during the war. And some labor unions tried that and they were arrested. It's okay if you strike before the war. We're not crazy about it, but it's okay. Or when the war is over, when we've won, go ahead and strike. But not during the war. You can't shut down a factory that is producing goods that we need
to win this war. Also, conscientious objectors, write that down. Conscientious objectors are going to be persecuted. Do you, well, you're not here. You can't answer this question. But I, let me just tell you what a conscientious objector is. A conscientious objector is someone who says, a conscientious objector is someone who says, I cannot fight. My conscience tells me that I cannot fight. Uh, it is against my moral beliefs and values. You know, there's a sect of Christianity called the Quakers. Uh, and they uh, are uh, generally pacifists meaning that they're against all violence, including war. And during war, their members will say uh, they, they are conscientious objectors. They refuse to fight. They refuse to serve. Not all of them. The last Quaker president we had in this country was Richard Nixon. He was a Quaker. But when World War II came, Richard Nixon joined the Navy and fought in combat uh, out in the Pacific. Okay, so it's sort of up to each individual. But as a group... Uh, Quakers, and that's just one example that I can give you, uh, are conscientious objectors. And of course, what do many, many people say when somebody steps up and says, I am a conscientious objector? What do many, many people say? They say they're just simply cowards. They don't really object to war. They're just using, they're afraid to fight, and they're just using that as an excuse. Of course, I think probably, uh, I haven't seen it, but every time I mention it, people nod their heads, so I know a lot of you have seen it, but uh, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you, if not all of you, have seen the movie uh, Hacksaw Ridge. And that's uh, supposed, I haven't researched it, but I think it's supposed to be a true story about a young man during World War II who's called into service, but he refuses to fight. He refuses to fight. He went into the army, but he refused to fight. He said, I cannot carry a gun. I cannot kill the enemy. Uh, and so instead he became a medic. Now, you want to talk about a dangerous job in warfare as a medic, especially in combat. You know, here's a guy unarmed, generally, and he's out between the lines, uh, exposed to fire from both sides, and he's trying to save lives. Uh, there isn't a more dangerous, I, I, I don't think there's a more dangerous job in warfare. And that's what this young man became. And uh, uh, at the Battle of Okinawa, which was the bloodiest battle of World War II, at the Battle of Okinawa, uh, he unarmed, didn't have a gun, wouldn't shoot back, but he saved uh, over, I believe, over 130. I believe this is true. Correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but over 130 um, American lives and, and, and risked his own life many, many times in that battle. But he was a conscientious objector. Uh, in fact, got this down, and, and, and people, of course, if you said in World War I you were a conscientious objector, you risk getting lynched or at least arrested and sent to jail. Uh, it's interesting, though, that, uh, you know, people who say, well, those conscientious objectors are just cowards. It's interesting that our most famous uh, World War I, uh, the most decorated soldier that we had in World War I, write his name down here. It's Alvin York, okay? Alvin was a conscientious objector. He was a Tennessee mountain boy. There he is with his mother in his uniform. He got his draft notice. He was a devoutly a religious young man, devout Christian. And when he got his draft notice, he told his mother, he said, I cannot go because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Okay. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. Well, that's, that's uh, a mistranslation, by the way. I mean, just like you all my life, and that's what you see, uh, you know, uh, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill. And if you take that as its word, that means that you shouldn't kill. You shouldn't kill in war if somebody's breaking in. I mean, if it says thou shalt not kill, if someone's breaking in your house about to cause you bodily harm, you just stand there and you take it. But that's a mistranslation, okay, of that. You know, the original language of the Old Testament was Hebrew. Uh, the, the Old Testament's been translated into every language on earth, I suspect. Uh, and it's certainly uh, English. Most of you at home, if you have a Bible, it's, I bet you it's a King James Version. King James Version of the Bible was printed in 1611. In, in other words, uh, King James had his translators uh, translate the Old Testament from Hebrew into English, okay? And uh, there are several mistranslations. 
One of the most notable is that verse right there, that we're all taught from the time you're that high. Thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill in the original language. It says in Hebrew, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not murder. Uh, doesn't say anything about self-defense. Doesn't say anything if you go to war defending your country and you kill someone, thou shalt not murder. That's what it says. Mistranslation. Those things can be pretty dangerous. Kind of like in Exodus, it says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. When they translated that into English, thou shalt not suffer a witch. And that verse right there may be led to the death, death of thousands of little old ladies in Europe during the middle. Thou shalt not suffer a witch. Don't let a witch live. That's what that means. It's a mistranslation. What it said in Hebrew is thou shalt not, uh, you know, thou shalt not let a poisoner live. Someone who poisons other people and murders them. Okay, of course, uh, you know, I guess right in the middle of all this witch burning, they say, well, what, what was the number one crime they came up with for witches? What were we? Poisoning people, okay, so that fits nicely. Anyway, yeah, watch that translation stuff. Anyway, his, she, his mother was concerned about him. She thought he'll go to prison, so she contacted her pastor or their pastor, and the pastor came and he talked to Alvin York, and Alvin York, you know, he persuaded him that it was, he could still be a Christian and he could still go into combat and if he had to kill someone. And so Alvin York did that. He joined the army uh, and uh, he became our most decorated uh, war hero in World War I. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of people. He became our most decorated war hero, Alvin York. Most decorated mean, means that he won more medals than any other of the five million soldiers that served in World War I. And I guess Alvin York, his moment of glory came at the Battle of the Argonne Forest, okay? The Battle of the Argonne Forest. And uh, at the Argonne Forest, Alvin York uh, was leading, I think he was leading an eight-man patrol. And uh, they uh, sort of come down a little glen or a little gully like this. And it's overgrown with shrubs and trees and so forth. And uh, these eight men are out on patrol, and uh, all of a sudden they stumble into these Germans. And, uh, and York and his men just sort of ducked down, ducked down under the shrubbery in those trees. Now, they were actually, there were eight Americans, and they were actually surrounded by 132 Germans. Uh, and, of course, the Germans were looking to see where these Americans were, and every time a German would stick his head out, uh, Alvin York was a Tennessee mountain boy. He was a sure shot, and he would just put a bullet right between his eyes. And he killed so many Germans that day that the Germans became convinced that it was the Americans that had them uh, surrounded instead of the reverse. And so uh, you, the 100, I think it was 132 Germans dropped their guns and stood up. Uh, and surrender to these eight or 10 or 12 Americans. Anyway, a small patrol of Americans. And of course, that must have been one of the oddest scenes in warfare to see these uh, 132 Germans being herded back to, uh, back to uh, American lines to become prisoners of war. So uh, he wins many medals for that. He wins uh, the Medal of Honor. He's one of our most decorated veterans. But the thing is, is that he was a conscientious objector to begin with, okay? So for all those people that say, well, conscientious objectors are just cowards, obviously that's not true. Do some people use this classification, I'm a constant conscientious objector, do, to just get, yes, yes. But that doesn't mean that uh, people of conscience are cowards, as Alvin York or this young man uh, in the, the movie Hacksaw Ridge uh, in at the Battle of Okinawa, I, was, he was not a coward. He was the bravest of the brave, uh, and so was Alvin York, and they were both conscientious objectors. Anyway, let's bring it close to home. Write this young man down. <clears throat> I've got to go to a meeting here, so I'm going to hurry through this. Uh, this is Joseph Oklahoma, okay? He's from, he was from Wright City. Here's his Joseph Oklahoma. He was a Choctaw. I'm sure some of you are Choctaws. He was a Choctaw from Wright City. If you've ever been to Broken Bow or Ida Bell to watch the Ironheads play, you probably went through Wright City. It's not very, not a very large community, but that's where he was from. And uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma uh, was at the Battle of the Argonne Forest, the same battle that I talked about that Alvin York captured and his patrol captured 132 Germans. Well, get this, 
uh, Oklahoma, by the way, that last name means man killer, uh, Oklahoma, um, and 23 of his fellow soldiers, not many more than Alvin York had, actually killed 79 Germans and captured 171. They killed and captured uh, over 200 Germans at the same battle uh, that Alvin York did. Uh, however, uh, Oklahoma never received the Medal of Honor. Now, you talk about above and beyond the call of duty. In my opinion, anybody that puts on the uniform of the United States uh, and defends it, they, they literally, lay, or any country, they lay their line, they lay their lives, well, I won't say any country, but they lay their lives on the line for their country. Um, I think they deserve the respect of, uh, you know, the American people. This young man did that, but he didn't get the Medal of Honor. And the reason he didn't get the Medal of Honor, get this down, this is 1918, is that Native Americans were not citizens of the United States. Native Americans were not citizens of the United States. Plus he's a Native American. Racism. Uh, he's a Native American. <clears throat> uh, but, <clears throat> you know, he doesn't get it. By the way, when did Native Americans become citizens of the United States? It's 1918. Here the first or the original Americans are not even citizens of the United States. They don't become citizens until 1924. Write that down. The Indian Citizenship Act. Okay. But my point, one of my points is about Joseph Oklahoma. My point is this about him that, you know, again, anybody that would risk lay down their life for their country, I think deserves the respect of one and all. But these men love this country so much that even though this country had denied them citizenship, they're not even citizens of this country, they were willing to lay their lives down for it. Talk about uh, above and beyond the call of duty. Above and beyond. You know, they, 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 these Joseph Oklahoma and his uh, fellow Choctaws and other Native Americans uh, certainly deserve the gratitude of the United States the people of the United States, because they fought for this country at a time when this country didn't even recognize them as citizens. That's, I think, how much they loved uh, this, this country. And then one more man, this man, uh, Sergeant uh, Henry Johnson. Sergeant Henry Johnson. Henry Johnson, Henry Johnson <clears throat> was... Uh, a member, you know, the, the military was segregated in those days. And so Henry Johnson was a member of the 369th Harlem. They call themselves this. Let me get a black marker here. Maybe you can see that better. The 369th, the 369th Harlem Hellfighters. 369th Harlem Hellfighters. That's what they were called. And by the way, at the time, Harlem in New York, Harlem, New York, was, I suspect, the most famous African-American community in the United States. I think the ethnicity of the community has changed. I think it's largely today a Hispanic community. But in 1917, uh, 1918, it was a, uh, a African-American community, very famous in the 1920s, you're going to have, and we're talking about this, you're going to have the Harlem Renaissance. You've got great writers like James Baldwin. You've got great musicians in Harlem. I mean, they set the tone for the whole country. People like Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. Uh, perhaps some of you have heard of those. They're the creators of jazz music. Uh, all of that comes out of Harlem, okay? So the Harlem Renaissance, it was one of the uh, most prosperous uh, cities in the United States of America. And that's where he came from. And so, uh, you know, these, these African-Americans uh, volunteered to fight in World War I. Uh, they couldn't, they, you know, again, their, their own unit was the 369th because um, the country was thoroughly segregated, including the military. But this man, Henry Johnson, killed so many Germans uh, that the Germans called him the Black Death, the Black Death, okay? And his moment of glory... I guess you could say his moment of glory came on the night of May 4th, 1918. Okay, you don't have to have that date down. But uh, Johnson, you know, he was out between the trenches 
here are the Germans. This is no man's land. And Johnson and some of his fellow soldiers had been put out in no man's land on picket duty. That's what they would have called in the Civil War picket duty. In other words, you were out there in advance. It's a dangerous job. You're out there in advance of your own lines there to serve as a warning in case the Germans tried to launch a su surprise attack. Well, that night, the Germans, or that day, the Germans had decided to that night send 30 men out into no man's land and try and capture some of these Americans, not kill them, capture a couple of them and bring them back uh, and interrogate them and find out all this information about the Allied Army. So they weren't going to kill them. They were going to try and capture them. And so that night, that's exactly what happened. 30 Germans, 30, uh, came out, sneaked out of their trenches, and they came across no man's land, and they surprised Johnson and one of his buddies, okay, there. Uh, and uh, instead of running, Johnson and his buddy uh, put up a, a ferocious fight. Uh, they threw hand grenades until they were all gone. Then they, they got out their rifles and fired the, the, their rifles and pistols until all the ammunition was gone. And then they took their rifle butts like a club. They took their rifle butts like a club and they literally beat Germans to death with that. German soldiers to death with that. They beat them until the rifle butt turned uh, to splinters. In all of this, Johnson was wounded, I think, 21 times in this fight. Uh, his buddy was severely wounded uh, and, the, and a group of Germans grab his buddy and he's about to drag him off. And uh, back to the trenches, the man was still alive, and uh, Johnson pulled out his bolo knife. I don't know if you know, they kind of look like a boomerang a little bit, but it's a two-edged knife, and it's razor sharp, and he set in on the Germans trying to carry his buddy off to their trenches, and he killed several of them. When it was all over, the 30 Germans, of the 30 Germans that attacked uh, Henry Johnson and his comrade, uh, only one was, was unhurt. Uh, they killed several of them. I'm not saying all 29 of them were killed, but only one came out of it without some sort of wound, without being killed or wounded. Johnson, like I say, was wounded 21 times. Some of them were sort of minor, but some of them were pretty serious in his buddy. But, but they made it back uh, to the Allied lines, Johnson and his uh, fellow soldier, uh, and they, you know, were treated and, and lived through the war. Uh, he was not uh, uh, awarded the... Um, he was not awarded the uh, Medal of Honor uh, at that time. However, uh, the French uh, army gave, the French nation gave Henry Johnson the highest award uh, that they could. Uh, it's called the Croix de Guerre. You don't have to write that down. The Cross of War, that's what it is, the Cross of War. Uh, they gave that to uh, Henry Johnson. Uh, but the United States did not give him the Medal of Honor for that uh, valiant uh, fight. Uh, until 2015, Long after he was dead, President Obama, in a ceremony at the, at the White House, awarded Henry Johnson, posthumously, long after he was dead, awarded him uh, the, medal, the Medal of Honor, okay? Um, the Medal of Honor. Well, the loyalty issue, get this down. Uh, when we come back, we're going to stop here today. But when we come back on Thursday, and I ask you where we left off, write down the loyalty issue. The loyalty issue. OK, and remember that this is, uh, again, Thursday. Tomorrow is the final day for makeup test. So you be here for that as well.